So Ronald Cohen is perhaps best known as a venture capitalist, having founded a very successful Apex fund. Well, now he's turned his attention from financial return to social capital, and he joins us now on INSEAD Knowledge. Welcome. Uh, you're perhaps best known as, as a venture capitalist, and yet now you've been spending most of your time working in this entirely new field. What made you decide to make the change from financial capital to social capital? What motivated me to do it is the same thing that motivated me to get into venture capital in the first place. I got into venture capital because I wanted to do something that was socially useful. And, you know, I came here to this country as a refugee and also something that would enable me uh, to maintain a happy standard of living and to look after my parents. And even in 2002, as early as 2002, I made a speech on the 30th anniversary of Apex in which I said, look, if we do not tackle social issues very differently, a curtain of fire will come to separate the rich from the poor in our cities, in our regions, in our countries, and even in, you know, in continents. I came to realize that growth creates jobs, but growth doesn't really reduce the gap between rich and poor. In fact, what I noticed is the gap gets bigger and bigger. And those who are left behind are mired in misery and can't get out of it, can't escape it. And the question is, well, how do you get them to escape it? How do you both raise the standard of living and reduce the gap between the two? And I began to realize that our capitalist system does not have a bit of it that is solely devoted to dealing with the consequences of the system. And how would you describe, in simple terms, actually what this is, what social enterprise is, what social capital is, and how it differs from the conventional economic models? Well, many of us talk in terms of the invisible hand of the market. If, as Adam Smith said, if the baker produces bread to make a profit and feeds the hungry in the process, everybody is, is better off. Here we're talking in terms of the invisible heart. We're talking about people who are motivated to improve the lives of others. There are 800,000 people in the UK working in not-for-profits to achieve just that. There are 11 million across Europe. There are 10 million in the United States. Typically, these people have only been able to access philanthropic capital. Now we're saying to them, you don't have to go and look for donations only. If you can deliver a social performance, we can link it to a financial return. If you can deliver 7% on a social impact bond, then you can raise 10 million, 20 million pounds, euros, dollars, whatever it is, in order to build the scale of your organization to something that can really impact the social issue that you care about. So it's all about the invisible heart. It starts with people rather than with money. What you seem to be saying is that actually this is not an either or, you know, it's either a financial return or it's a social return, but actually it's part of a, if you like, a, a continuum, a spectrum. Exactly. I'm saying in some cases they go totally together. In other cases there may be some trade-off between the two, but different investors are looking for a different balance between the two. I think if you look at um, the Bridges funds, which invest in the poorest parts of Britain, Bridges now has something like $500 million under, under management. We've achieved 15% net IRR over 10 years. I would say that's market rate of return. Your social return comes on top of a market rate of return, right? There is absolutely no contradiction between achieving a social return and a financial return because the business models that Bridges companies develop in poorer areas are much more value for money orientated, price sensitive, investment effective and all the rest of it than what you'd find in the mainstream economy. So there's no conflict at all. So give me an example about how that actually works, how you're getting access with capital to parts of the economy, parts of society that wouldn't normally have access to it. So I think a good example is the first uh, social impact bond, the Peterborough bond, which was launched in September 2010 here in the UK. It started with a desire to help prisoners who today 
if they're incarcerated before the age of 21, re-offend two-thirds of them within the first year. And we said to the government, through these not-for-profits, we are going to attempt to reduce the percentage that re-offends. Now, if we fail to reduce it by more than 7.5%, the five million pounds will be lost. The investors will lose all their money. If on the other hand, these not-for-profits with our help, providing them with expertise in recidivism, support and so on and so forth, reduce it by seven and a half to 15 percent, then the government will pay back the five million pounds and a yield on the social impact bond that will go from two and a half percent to 13 percent, depending on the reduction you would hit a 13% return at a 15% reduction. So by linking the social performance and the financial performance, we enabled the St. Giles' Trust to say, on top of the philanthropy that it is receiving by way of grants, there's a layer of capital in its balance sheet, which is performance-based. And I think the implications of this are huge. Is this revolutionary new model that you're talking about, is it actually only really applicable to small and medium enterprises, perhaps in, in the philanthropic and the social area, or is it actually scalable and something that can be used by larger for-profit organisations? No, I think some, some companies are definitely trying to integrate it into their business models, into their organisation, to inculcate values and so on and so forth. There's no doubt about that. I'm a bit influenced by the fact that revolutions are usually made by outsiders. Uh, and if you look at the venture capital industry, uh, I lived through the PC revolution, the internet, etc., etc. There was a debate before the PC became the PC about whether IBM would dominate the field. And opinions were divided about whether IBM would win or the upstarts would win. And the upstarts won. And I think here too, the revolution is likely to come from within the social sector and then begin to illuminate the ways in which different business models have social impact. As the metrics of the social sector become more sophisticated, corporations will adopt them and change their business models. But I think it's the beginning of a, of, of a revolution uh, which will affect the mindsets of corporations, of investors, of government, of entrepreneurs, of executives, just as the entrepreneurial business revolution did. Sir Ronco, thank you very much for joining us here on Great pleasure.